Welcome in A-Push Nation, uh, coming to you live again from Classroom 214 here. And tonight's topic has one central theme for our fireside chat, and that is what happens in England directly affects what happens in the colonies. You'll hear me say that over and over again for the next couple of weeks, because as we continue our progression in looking at colonial history, we're now at a point where we've established that the 13 colonies are firmly entrenched uh, in the British system. And <clears throat> now... You know, the question becomes, so with the British having 13 colonies here, how are these colonies ultimately going to best serve the mother country? And that's where that term of mercantilism uh, definitely becomes prominent in understanding uh, colonial history. Now, I'm not going to go through a whole huge breakdown of mercantilism here other than to remind you of a definition that you guys have probably heard before, which is the fact that mercantilism is, is, is such a system, an economic system of trade, that combines the South Atlantic system, combines triangular trade patterns, Columbia Exchange, Atlantic slave trade, all those different trade routes we've talked about. And the idea is that under mercantilism, everything that the British colonies were producing and exporting and importing should only go to the benefit of the mother country. Why have a system in which uh, New England colonies producing timber are selling it to the French and the French is now getting the benefit of, of British resources? So mercantilism was a dominant theory that as the, all the colonies, not just English, but French and Dutch and Spanish and whatnot, uh, each country practiced its own form of mercantilism. Now, the British uh, way to enforce mercantilism was through the Navigation Acts. And I think that was on a reading quiz not that long ago. And these Navigation Acts were, were laws created to govern mercantilism, to ensure that the colonies were only trading with the British. And a lot of times the colonists... To them, these laws were, were sort of pesky. Uh, some followed them, others didn't. And if you were breaking mercant mercantile laws, typically you were probably smuggling goods uh, to get that good French bread or that good French wine or that good Spanish tobacco, whatever the case may be, at a cheaper cost than you could from an English good. So a lot of ways to thwart mercantilism were to, to break the laws, to smuggle goods. And certainly the British, this was discouraging to them in keeping the benefit of mercantilism going. As England's uh, vice, its grip on the colonial, uh, the, the colonies began to, to tighten, however, um, when that began was really during the reign of James II. And so as a monarchy from last year, hopefully you guys recall from, from AP Euro, James was a highly controversial monarchy. He was believed to be a secret Catholic. But he really wanted to lock down the colonies and start to take away some of their independence and really to sort of make them accountable uh, in terms of following the mercantile system that the British was hoping was going to build their empire even larger. So James had a bold plan, a bold plan when in the middle of the 1680s, middle of the 1680s, James enacted what was known as the Dominion of New England. Please make sure that term you guys get down, the Dominion of New England. Now, the Dominion of New England was a bold move. And basically, uh, again, the purpose of this Dominion was going to be to help make sure the colonies were following mercantile laws. Also, it was looking for the new monarchy since James took over uh, the monarchy in 1686. He was looking to basically clamp down on the colonies and further clench Britain's control over the colonies. What the Dominion basically was, was think about what we have all the colonies in New England. We've got Massachusetts Bay, we've got Plymouth, we've got New Hampshire, uh, and then we've got Rhode Island and Connecticut. Well, well James took or the second, uh, administered a system where all those colonies were lumped into one colony. And then later, two years after this, in, in 1688, New York and New Jersey colonies were added into this new conglomeration. So the Dominion of New England was basically an area of seven colonies. And I'll put this on the screen tomorrow in class. I don't have time to put this into the video today because I'm doing this right before a seventh hour comes in. So the Dominion of New England was seven colonies all lumped into one. And this move was highly, and I mean highly protested. The colonists hated um, the Dominion of New England. They viewed it as very punitive. Uh, they viewed it as something that was very much uh, thwarting their own identity. And in order to really merge these seven colonies into one, uh, there needed to be very strong administ administrative control. And that's when uh, Sir Edmund Andros, A-N-D-R-O-S, Sir Edmund Andros, a name you absolutely need to know. 
Andros was appointed as the governor of the Dominion of New England, their president, their governor, whatever you want to call it. Now, Andros was a, a, a soldier. He was a public servant, but he was not a politician. And when you put someone like that now in front of seven colonies, he's managing seven total colonies that had for almost 100 years been completely autonomous of one another with different backgrounds and different identities emerging culturally. Andrus was now in charge of these seven colonies. And his orders, which he was getting from back in England, um, were to, number one, he shut down all the colonial assemblies. They were banned during the, the, the reign of, of the Dominion of New England. He taxed the colonists without their consent of representation, foreshadow, <laughs> and also he vigorously tried to set up stricter navigation acts uh, to prevent smuggling. So Andrus is shutting down the, the colonies' attempts to organize in their local colonial assemblies. He's taking away um, their ability to smuggle, which was very important to the colonists. And uh, again, as, as the foreshadowing element, the colonists were being taxed heavier. Um, this set up an uproar. This set up an uproar, and many of the local uh, assemblies and many of the, of the colonies began to protest. There were all sorts of protests in Massachusetts. There were all sorts of protests in Connecticut. Connecticut was one of the most volatile colonies to protest against the, the Dominion. Uh, and ultimately, <clears throat> this became a very big moment uh, in the relationship between the colonists and the, the, the British because all of a sudden now you've got this volatile situation percolating up. And Andrus just was, no matter what he tried to do, um, could not unify these colonies in, into, into one body. Um, and so the, 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 the Dominion of New England should be best remembered for really the first attempt by the British government, the monarchy, to clamp down on the colonies. And the end result is going to be this is a complete failure an abject failure of politics. And so what are the two, there's two things that, that lead to the, the, the dominion coming to a crashing halt. Now think back to what I said at the beginning of this chat. What happens in England directly affects the colonies. Well, you guys know from Euro that in 1689, a watershed moment in British politics occurred with the Glorious Revolution. James II was forced to abdicate the throne. He fled to, I believe, France, where he continue to practice his Catholicism. And William and Mary from, from, from the Netherlands came in to rule over England. And they were forced to sign the Bill of Rights. And this was a watershed moment in English history because you've got a king and queen coming in from a foreign country to take over um, the throne of England. The colonists wildly celebrated the Glorious Revolution because with the Glorious Revolution came an abrupt halt to the Dominion of New England. Andrus was removed from the colonies and <clears throat> word spread to the colonies that with the change in leadership, that could mean the sign of things to come. But we've got one more story to tell you here. When word, was, was, had, word had yet been received in the colonies that William and Mary had taken over and James II was on his way out. So before word arrived, a rebellion in New York State was started by, by a man named Jacob Leisler, L-E-I-S-L-E-R, Jacob Leisler. Leisler was a Dutch immigrant living in the former Dutch colony of New York, which was now British, and Leisler organized a rebellion in an attempt to overthrow the administrative rulers of the Dominion of New England. Now, Leisler's attempt uh, involved a lot of violence. It was an armed rebellion against the Dominion of New England. And Leisler was, was acting upon the instincts and rumors that William and Mary were coming to the throne. And he hoped that the new monarchy would see his, his rejection of James II's dominion of New England and would celebrate it as, 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 a, as a unifying um, event. Plus, Leisler was Dutch, so he thought with the Dutch king, this would work out in the end for him. However, Leisler's rebellion turned out to be bloody, not just for the for the Dominion of New England uh, rulers that were killed, but also for Jacob Leisler and some of his followers. And when William and Mary took the throne in 1689, they condemned and sentenced Leisler to death and some of his followers that, that also were part of this, this attempt to overthrow the Dominion of New England. A, really a shocking turn of events for Jacob Leisler, who was acting under the assumption that 
his rebellion would spark the rejection of the Dominion of New England, when instead the king and queen um, condemned Leisler as a usurper, and they had him sentenced to death for treason. So it's an interesting turn of events for Jacob Leisler, but that is a name and an ID concept that I would have, um, very similar to, to Bacon's Rebellion, in the sense that this was a colonial protest, uh, colonial rebellion that, that mounted. Um, but ultimately, the Glorious Revolution, what happened in England with the change in the monarchy, would lead to the end of the Dominion of New England, and the failure of the Dominion uh, really forced a great deal of change. And what goes on in uh, England during this time is the rise of the Whig Parliament leaders. And the new Whigs, these young British uh, politicians that came to power during the Glorious Revolution, they're going to shift completely their ideas about how to rule the colonies. And that is going to set up a tremendous turning point moment that we will certainly cover in class. So for today, to recap, I would say what you most want to be aware of, you need to know the names Edmund Andrus. You need to be aware that James II was king who enacted the Dominion of New England. You should be aware that the, the, the Dominion was made up of seven colonies, all the New England colonies plus New York and New Jersey eventually. You should be aware that the Glorious Revolution brought down the Dominion of New England, and you should also be aware of Jacob Leisler's revolution. But most importantly, what you need to be aware of is that what happens in England affects the colonies directly. So on that note, I bid you good evening. Whenever you're watching this, have a good rest of the night, A-Push Nation. Remember, the past shapes the future.